it's a bit of ancient uh, artificial intelligence, a, a machine that seems to respond intelligently to human questioning. This is our humble hemp patch. 5,000 years of medical cannabis use. We're learning about other cannabinoids. Marijuana is grown in every state in the union. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. The I Ching has been one of the most helpful tools I've encountered in my life. There are many oracular systems out there and systems of divination, but usually when people say the oracle, they mean the I Ching. Being able to ask the I Ching questions when I'm at a crossroads in my life has always taken me from confusion and hesitation to clarity and confidence. I somehow found an edition of this old Chinese book in college, and to it, I attribute much of the success of my life since. Well, that and the Pennsylvania Dutch work ethic. So what is the I Ching, and why have I dedicated the penultimate episode of our first season to it? Why did I subject today's expert, Fred Hatt, to three interview sessions? And why did I ask him to craft a question and cast a reading for our times? Because I believe of all the things that we've covered in this first season, the I Ching can make your life better, right now, before the end of the day. And if you think I'm waxing eloquent about it now, you should see me after I smoke a little hashish, which apparently is what some scholars believe that the ancient Chinese shamans used to do before they consulted the I Ching. The I Ching, also known as the Book of Changes, is a book of divination with its roots in Bronze Age China, more than 3,000 years ago. To use it, you first choose a question to ask the book. Then you generate random patterns by throwing coins or by throwing stalks of yarrow. These give a pattern of six lines known as a hexagram. And you look up those hexagrams in your book. There you'll find a corresponding verse, and you'll be surprised at how much these randomly selected verses say about the question you asked. We'll let Fred explain about the patterns of hexagrams, trigrams, and changing lines later. The images and ideas described in these verses, which are often cryptic, are cues for the diviner to interpret in light of the question under consideration. Any I Ching book will describe the system in detail, but there's considerable variation in how different authors seek to find meaning in the verses and in the system. I must say, for all the divination methods I've seen, and all the drug experiences I've had, and all the shiny, happy gatherings of people that I've been to, almost nothing compares to the mystery I feel from working with the I Ching. As someone who started off as a very reductionist scientist, in the early years of working with the I Ching, it was eerie how often I'd ask a question, and the answer would be so directly relevant to what I just asked that it would make me look over my shoulder to see if somebody was there watching and pulling the strings. I swear, sometimes it feels like the book is giving you a sly smile. If even just a few of you listening start playing around with the I Ching because of this episode, then all of our work on this one is worth it. Because the I Ching is so helpful that once you get started, it's easy to see its worth and to start using it for questions in your life. And then once you use it for enough years, some of the lessons about balance, self cultivation and going with the flow, they start to sink in and you don't need the book quite as often. Plus, for you aficionados out there, Fred leads us into a reading for the world situation today and I think you'll be surprised by the power of the Oracle's answer. Hello everybody, I'm very happy to be joined by Fred Hatt today. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. And so you do, you live in New York, you do a lot of different jobs and you're an artist as well. Yeah. Um, but one of the ways we got to know each other was through the I Ching. And just for people who had never heard of it before, can you talk about the basics of what it is and maybe a little bit of how we know about how it got developed? Well, the I Ching is one of the oldest books in the world, really. It originates from the Bronze Age of China, so uh, no one knows exactly how old it is, but uh, there are many traditions of divination around the world or uh, fortune-telling, but the I Ching was one that uh, got uh, put down in writing a really long time ago, and uh, the, you know, divination, like tarot cards, you draw cards, you put them in a particular order. There's various forms of, uh, of uh, traditional divination using um, other sort of chance operations or observations of nature, like the entrails of birds or whatever. The I Ching is a system, there's a ritual of dividing and counting sticks that generates 
random results that refer to this set of 64 hexagrams or six line figures, each of which has a poem. And then each of the six lines has its own verse. So the, the diviner will go through this ritual, come up with something that uh, is in response to a question. Uh, and the I Ching, the Book of Changes, really embodies a philosophy of how things change in the world, different processes. It's sort of based on the idea that change is cyclical and that when things go so far in a certain direction, they reverse. Uh, and that's just built into the way the thing is designed. It's filled with links, and uh, it changes its form in every time you use it. So for that reason, it's fascinated a lot of uh, modern artists and writers. And in China, it became one of the classics of ancient Chinese literature in the time of uh, Confucius, uh, the philosopher Confucius sort of, cre um, or his school, uh, was credited with creating a canon of the ancient Chinese classic literature. And the I Ching was included in that. It's all, it's this huge collection of cryptic little images and phrases. And Confucian and Taoist philosophers were able to use it as the basis for all kinds of interpretive works. And uh, there have been thousands of commentaries written on the I Ching over the centuries. Because it was one of the Confucian classics, it was uh, something that an educated person in China would naturally write essays about, just like rewrite essays about you know, Moby Dick and Paradise Lost and that kind of thing. So it is basically an ancient divination system that became a literary classic and uh, a piece of experimental literature. Uh, when you give readings uh, for other people, you know, how does that go? You know, how do you come in and sit them down and walk them through what's going to happen and how they craft their question? Basically, you kind of try to talk to the person about what their concerns are and um, figure out what kind of a question will will work with the I Ching. You know, it, it doesn't really work with um, binary or multiple choice questions very well. The way that it really works is in giving you a, a, an approach, a way of thinking about something. So we try to kind of put the question in that form, like, um, you know, as I undertake this next stage in my life, maybe somebody is going to start a graduate degree program or something like that. What, uh, what should be my focus or... Uh, or what should I watch out for, or something like that. That kind of question um, works really well because it gives you a metaphor. So I, I would try to help someone formulate the the kind of question, the kind of way of thinking that the that the I Ching works well for. Most people that have had some experience with the I Ching have uh, done it by throwing coins. Uh, there's a simple method of throwing coins to generate the hexagrams. Uh, I learned, I mean, that's the way I did it when I started out, but I, I learned the uh, traditional method using the yarrow stalks. Uh, and uh, that method is rather slow. It takes at least 20 minutes to get to generate a hexagram that way. But that's part of the reading process. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a ritual and it sort of calms the mind to go through this, this process. And of course, during that whole time that you're doing it, also the unconscious mind is, is holding this question. And uh, in, in many cases, I think that really enriches the response that you get because it's been the question that you have has been simmering in the unconscious mind during the the process of dividing and counting these sticks over and over again. 
I mean, the hard part is, is, is how complicated it can sound for people who haven't heard about it, but you know, it's actually can be quite easy to get started, you know, coins and even a book online would do it. Um, what would mm -hmm. you say to the person who is intrigued by this and wants to get started? Start with uh, one of the well-known versions. The most popular is the, the Wilhelm translation which is which published in the 1930s, I think. And that one is uh, easy to find. And uh, there are, I, I believe the whole text of that is online. And um, try, I would try doing the coin readings at first because, uh, and you can easily find instructions on how to do that. And that doesn't take so much time. And uh, ask some simple questions and just kind of explore into it. If you, if you find it interesting, there are so many resources. Um, the Wilhelm book has uh, uh, much of the, the traditional ancient commentary about the I Ching, including an essay called, I think it's called The Great Treatise, that is sort of explains um, what is the philosophy behind the I Ching. So that, that's a good place to start. To get a traditional idea of it. A lot of people are interested in divination. Um, and there are things like, you know, the magic eight ball or eeny, meeny, miny, mo that are very simplistic. But the more sophisticated forms of divination, which include, of course, tarot and astrology, will give you very complex, very rich metaphors and ways of relating different ideas. They're, they're cues for the creative mind. So uh, they don't give you an answer. They give a person something to apply their own creativity and their own wisdom to. And you mentioned something about the, the background philosophy. It might be a good time to dive into that now that we've covered more of the basics. Because you know, at the, the core of it would be the lines are either a yin or a yang. Um, and it goes right. back to that ancient idea of the constant flow. So I was wondering if you could talk about those and maybe how they turn into the trigrams. Right. Okay. And it's, it's, it's interesting. The I Ching kind of passes the Turing test, doesn't it? It's a little, it's a bit of ancient uh, artificial intelligence, a, a machine that seems to respond intelligently to uh, human questioning. Uh, and curiously, uh, of course, our modern ideas of artificial intelligence are based on this binary mathematics. Uh, everything is converted into a one or a zero. And the I Ching is that also. It's, it's a solid line or a broken line. Uh, every result gives you uh, this a series of solid or broken lines. Some people convert those into a zero and a one, which is the the com uh, modern computer code version of of that. And um, those are associated with this sort of primal duality, yin and yang, which I'm sure people have heard of. The yin and yang could be associated with almost any kind of uh, duality or polarity. Uh, but originally what it means is um, the sunlit side or the shady side of a mountain. Yang is the, the sunny side and yin is the, the shady side. So it's light and dark. And um, the I Ching also has in it a, a even more ancient, I think, duality about the first two hexagrams, the first two signs are sky and earth. And uh, sky and earth is a kind of a shamanic duality. But the yin and yang lines, every time that you go through your ritual of throwing coins or counting sticks, you generate either a solid line or a broken line. The broken line is yin or dark or uh, receptive. The uh, solid line is yang or bright or active. And in, in the process of taking a reading, you build a set of six of these starting at the bottom and going up. It's quite, it's interesting because so much, all, all of our language and everything, we, we start at the top and read down. 
But in the I Ching, you build something from the ground. Uh, you build a figure from the ground up. Now, each of these lines is a solid line or a broken line, but some of them are also changing lines. That is, they are um, a, a yin line, that is, a broken line, that is ready to change into a solid line or a yang line. It's called old yin, the idea that uh, if something has been in the, the passive state for a while, it will be ready to flip and uh, turn the other way. It's kind of the, you know, the idea that we have about the pendulum, uh, like the political pendulum, or that things reach a certain extreme and then they reverse and start going the other way. Uh, and then an old, uh, an old yang line is a solid line that is about to turn into a broken line. And when you build a, f a six line figure, a hexagram out of these solid or broken lines, and some of them are changing lines, you change the changing lines and you get a second hexagram. And these two hexagrams give you a sort of a direction, um, one idea changing to another. Sometimes you can even read it like a, a, a two word sentence, you know, with the, the names of the two symbols. But there are 64 possible hexagrams in just in, not including changing lines, just in terms of the, the different arrangements of broken and solid lines creates 64 possibilities. And uh, each of those has a name and it's got a verse associated with it and various images and so on. And then there are also lines of verse associated with each of the six lines, which normally we, we look at for the changing lines only. So that's, that's the basic structure of it. It incorporates this idea that everything is always changing that when things reach a certain extreme, they reverse, and that the state of change in any one moment, which is what you symbolize with this hexagram, is an interrelation of strong and weak, or active and passive or reactive forces, and how those active and receptive forces relate to each other uh, creates a certain pattern that's always changing. But if you understand the pattern in a moment, you can um, respond to that and act effectively. It's interesting because it does have a very scientific feel to it in terms of, especially as you get closer to quantum mechanics and how much things are, are shifting. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that the, one of the first people in the West who was very interested was the German mathematician uh, Leibniz. Um, yeah. And he saw so much value here, um, as well as the fact that there's 64 um, uh, possibilities in the genetic code as well, which people have turned into a thing. Right, right. Well, you know, Leib Leibniz actually um, was one of the mathematicians who really started developing binary mathematics, which is the foundation of all computer code. And he was inspired to do that by seeing a, di a, a chart of the I Ching hexagrams and understanding it as a binary code. So the, the, uh, the I Ching is, in, is absolutely at the root of digital technology and computer science. And then those hippies who were taking LSD and starting the computer revolution were also really into it as well, which is fascinating. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I was going to ask about in the terms of the structure was the, the three different trigrams that or the, right. the three lines that make up a trigram. And so right. there would be eight of those. There's eight different possibilities. There are, there are eight. There are eight possibilities of the three line figure. And, uh, and those are really interesting too. Those are, um, each one of the eight trigrams is, has a sort of an elemental image associated with it, you know, um, thunder and wind and mountain and marsh and earth and sky and so on. And, and, um, 
each of those has uh, is a very rich poetic metaphor. It's not just the natural image, but it's associated with um, different uh, attitudes, different ways of, uh, of moving. As an example, one of the trigrams is uh, thunder or uh, shock, and uh, its opposite is wind or wood. And uh, it's, that's, those are associated, the thunder is like a sudden, something that's sudden, sudden change, shock, or something, or, or the way that things, uh, the way that things burst out in the spring, the growth happens so quickly. Um, and the other one, which is wind or wood, is associated with a much more subtle and imperceptible kind of growth, the way that plants can slowly grow and maybe break stones, crack the concrete. Uh, there's, there's a strength in something that happens very gradually and imperceptibly. And, and it's also associated with the, the wind, the moving air, the way it penetrates into any opening, the way that it slowly erodes things so that, uh, uh, over, over time it, things are smoothed out by this process. So those are, those are two, that's, that's another polarity, another duality on which you can see things. And every hexagram, of course, is two trigrams, an inner and an outer trigram. The inner trigram is seen as uh, sort of uh, the internal aspect of what, of the situation that you're looking at. And the upper or outer trigram is the outer aspect, the world outside of oneself. Uh, and uh, both of those then have the, these uh, elemental things. And you can really do a lot of interpretation just based on the symbolism of the, of the trigrams and how they relate to each other. And relate seems to be a really key word. It, when I learned oh, yeah. that you can visit, view them as a family, that there is a father and a mother, the, mm -hmm. the yin and the yang, and then three males and three female children, all of a sudden right. it, it makes them all just seem to work together just like and work against each other just like a family yeah. does. And I've had as much help right. in my work and business stuff as I have had in my personal relationships and advice in that realm. And, and the, the different translations of the verses of the I Ching also are really, uh, you know, the Wilhelm one that I mentioned before, this is probably the most famous translation, is kind of, um, it, it's based on the Confucian tradition, which is interpreting the I Ching readings uh, from the point of view of a, an administrator, a person in power, and how you use power. And everything is sort of written from that point of view, like, oh, you're a, a person of responsibility with power over people, and you're, these are the kind of decisions you're making. But of course, if you're not in a position of power, that version may not make much sense for you. And there are other translations that are more uh, psychological or more poetic, and those may be more valuable. So it's something that just has so many different facets that you could choose to look at it in whatever way works for you. Mm -hmm. um, if someone hadn't heard of the I Ching before, would you have a, a good first question for them to ask just to get started? Hmm. You know, if I were, if somebody was interested, I would have a conversation about with them about where they are in their life and what it is that they might be looking for, why they're interested in divination. And I would start from there, I guess. Next, Fred is going to perform a reading. As I mentioned in the intro, he's going to generate random patterns to select verses from the book. To get those patterns, you have three coins and you throw them six times. And with each throw, the coins land in either a solid line or a broken line, a yang or a yin. So six throws make six of those lines. That's why it's called a hexagram. The hexagram is built from the bottom up and there are 64 possible combinations. Thus, the I Ching has 64 hexagrams, similar to the 64 codons of the human genetic code. A set of three lines is called a trigram, and there are eight possible combinations of trigrams. Each of these hexagrams contains two trigrams, an outer trigram and an inner trigram. 
As you'll hear, the eight different trigrams are often referred to as a family. Three yang lines represent the father, heaven. Three yin lines is the mother, earth. Then they have three sons and three daughters, each of whom represents a different force of nature, such as fire, wind, mountain, and lakes. The core text of the I Ching is a set of verses for each of the 64 hexagrams, describing omens and auspices, with separate lines of verse corresponding to the six lines of each hexagram. And so now, Fred, we wanted to start the second part of this show on the I Ching and actually do a reading for everybody listening that hopefully people might find applicable and get a sense of what the reading is. But right. the first part of what you have to do with the I Ching is to frame your question, which can often be the most important or trickiest part. So could you talk about framing questions for the I Ching and how you came to the one you came up with for today? The, the I Ching is written in a way that is a, a very stripped down language, cryptic in a way. Um, it's, it's confusing. Sometimes it's hard to interpret, but that's because it's really written to be evocative and uh, in such a way that uh, a, a lot of the images don't really take on meaning until you apply them to a question. So uh, in some ways, the more, the more specific uh, your question can be, the more likely you are to be able to get some um, really in interesting interpretation out of the results of the I Ching. If it's too general, I find that you know a general question then uh, combined with these uh, cryptic verses it's hard to do much with. Um, so the question that I came up with, I, I wanted to obviously not do something that's personal or individual because this is a show for people who may have a, a general interest, all kinds of different people. Uh, but I wanted to have something that was specific enough that it would have something to stick with the verses that we get. So the question that I came up with is as follows. We are recording this in 2020, a year of crises that have exposed weaknesses in our institutions and in our relations with the natural world. So what sign may point us in a direction that will heal and strengthen our society? Now, that's a pretty broad question. Obviously, an I Ching reading isn't going to fully heal and strengthen our society, but I think we all are looking for uh, some kind of guidance or inspiration in in that anyone who thinks beyond their themselves and their own day to day life, particularly. So I'm hoping that um, we'll get something that will lead to an interesting discussion. Great, thank you. I do appreciate the question, and it, it speaks to how many ways the I Ching is used. That there are professors who use it for business school, that there are mm -hmm. Taoists who use it for personal development, and there are. It was originally used for kings and and rulers for right. how to work with their societies. Yeah, originally divination was used by warlords to decide whether to uh, attack or. <laughs> Uh, engage with a, an enemy or that that kind of thing. And uh, also, of course, making decisions about ceremonial things, weddings and uh, rituals and that kind of stuff. In the post-Confucian Chinese society uh, was kind of a bureaucratic society run by administrators who were expected to be highly educated. And part of their education was to study the I Ching. And so many of the traditional Confucian interpretations of the I Ching are from the point of view of a, a, an administrator, uh, and those can often be applicable to uh, you know so, a business person uh, today. And then, of course, uh, Carl Jung was interested in the uh, I Ching as a psychological document, and so some of the modern interpretations are uh, psychological. And um, I find, you know, most of the time when I do readings for people, that's the most, uh, that, that's the kind of thing they're looking for is something to guide them in their personal life. And that is, uh, uh, you know, quite different from the, the traditional uses of I Ching. 
and its traditional uses seem to affect that everybody approaches the book in a in a different way approaches the oracle in a different right. way and the ways they go about their own reading so for you what do you do before reading to get yourself ready and to get the the space ready before you either throw the yarrow stalks or throw the coins i don't do too much uh, in terms of um, ritual or or that kind of thing. Um, it's just mostly important to set your set your mind to it, uh, to um, kind of let go. If you have a, a question, you probably have already been thinking about your question and you have different thoughts about it and you just kind of want to let go of all of that uh, because uh, your the what the I Ching will do is will give you a different perspective, perhaps that you haven't thought of yet. And in order to be open to that, you need to kind of let go of everything that you've already been thinking about the question. Uh, so really, it's just opening the mind that way. And then um, when I am, as far as the physical things, um, you know, uh, if I'm doing the counting the yarrow stalks, I count them and make sure that I have the right number to start with. Um, or the, or I get the coins ready. You could do a, do it with three coins, which we'll do today. It's uh, faster than the uh, Yarrow stock method. And um, so I prepare those things. I have a piece of paper to write down uh, the lines as we receive them. And um, then I uh, usually have one or two or three I Ching books, some notes that I have. Uh, I have file folders that have uh, notes and things that I've used over the years. So I get that stuff ready so that uh, when we get a result, I can start reading and meditating on the hexagram that we receive from the I Ching and the lines. Okay. Um, should we let you go ahead and start throwing the coins? Sure, we could do that. Um, you could use any kind of coins. You know, some people use the old Chinese coins that have a hole in them or whatever. Uh, but you could use pennies or quarters or anything. Um, what I like to use is um, these uh, dollar coin, American dollar coins that have a. Uh, there, there are various different. Uh, ones there's Sacagawea and people like that uh, so they have a clear head and tail there's a head on one side and something else on the other side um, and uh, so I take three of those and in the coin method you just shake and toss all three coins and then um, we add up a value of two if the tail side is up and three if the head side is up and that will give you a number of six, seven, eight, or nine for each throw of the three coins. And um, an even number, six or eight, is a broken line. And an odd number, a seven or a nine, is a whole nine, because that's a number that doesn't break in half. And uh, six and nine are changing lines, so that if you have a six or a nine in your... Um, in your your hexagram you change those in a in a second hexagram the sevens and eights don't change the sixes and nines change to their opposite that generates a second hexagram so the first one is sort of you can interpret usually the first one as a um, you know the present state of change and the second one as a future direction or something like that depends how, how that works depends a little on your question. I also sometimes find when you have two hexagrams in a row like that, it's almost like two words or two concepts that can be interpreted as a sentence, as a very simple sentence. Uh, sometimes it works that way. So anyway, I guess I'll go ahead. I have three coins. I'm going to go ahead and toss them uh, and uh, we'll see what we get. So... There's one throw, and we have heads, tails, tails. So that is three, four, five, six, seven for our first. Our first line is a solid, unbroken line. 
build the hexagram from the bottom up. So the second, the second line, which I'm going to throw now, will go on top of that. And for the second line, we have heads, tails, tails, yet again. So it's another seven. And uh, third line, we have yet again a seven, head and two tails. And the third throw, we now have three heads. That's a nine. That's a changing line. That's a solid line, but that will change in the second hexagram. We have two more lines to throw. And we have uh, heads, heads, heads again, another nine. And we'll do now the last line. And that is, again, three heads, nine. So uh, this is interesting. Oh. Our, yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow. Our the uh, first time in my life I've seen that. Yeah. Um, our, our first hexagram is all uh, solid lines. And that is the, fir the very first hexagram in the whole I Ching. It's called uh, the creative or sky, heaven. It's, it's the yang principle. So uh, the first two hexagrams are basically sky and earth. Uh, you know, if you think about the, the dynamics of, of the planet, uh, all this energy comes from the sky in the form of sunlight and uh, weather, wind, rain, uh, the moon, and its influence, the stars, uh, the sort of the cosmic energy that flows from outside into the earth. And that is this sort of external, the, the movement of the atmosphere and all the energy in that. And then the, the earth is the second hexagram, which is represented by all broken lines is the earth. And that represents uh, basically the receptive or the productive principle that all this energy comes into the earth, which is made up of everything that is dead that has lived before. So it represents the past and um, the spirits, um, the the world of shadows and and so on. But also the uh, the birth, the birth giving potential. Uh, the energy comes from the sky and it fertilizes the earth and the earth produces everything, all of life, plants and animals and, and everything. So, um, so those are the first two principles. So the first, the first sign that we have is that sky principle. The second one that we have is um, number 11 among the... Uh, hexagrams. This one is um, basically earth above and sky below, which is interesting because it seems like uh, a reversal of the normal state of things. And this is uh, often uh, known as peace or uh, there are various uh, names for that hexagram. So um, what we'll do, I think I'll take a break and take a look at the books and um, what the the verses have to say and the verses for the changing lines, because it would take me a little time to to look at those things and think about them and think about them in terms of the question, and then we'll come back and see um, what it might mean or what it could tell us. That sounds great. Um, and just uh, one last thing I'll add to everyone listening at home that I, this is a really special thing to get all Yang lines. Uh, I've never seen that before. And when you look at different interpretations of the I Ching, one of the best ways to get to know the angle of what this partic particular translator or commentator is trying to, to say, you look at the first and second hexagram, the ones that are all the one that's all yang line and all mm -hmm. yin line to get yeah. what they think about these basic forces of nature. And so it's interesting that Right. And this reading we're doing for everyone, it's looking at that first. And the first lesson that came to my mind is, hey, you at home, you should do this. It works. We could all use this a little bit more <laughs> I Ching in our life. 
Right. And, you know, I decided to, um, I have a lot of I Ching books and so on. So I decided to limit um, which ones that I'll use uh, to look at this um, reading uh, just so that it, you know, uh, because I mean, basically there's so much material on I Ching that you could go, you could go very deep in the scholarship and everything. But um, I will look at, uh, I have lists of um, the interpretations of the names of the hexagrams by many, many different scholars and translators. And I'll look at those because those sometimes give you a sense of, you know, the range of what something can mean. These, these ancient characters are sort of, they're more broad than modern words. They're, they're sort of uh, large concepts that in, that mean different things in, in, in context. And so it's very uh, illuminating often just to look at the range of meanings that these different, uh, the names of the hexagrams can have. So I'll look at that. And then I will, I'm going to look at um, two uh, of the versions that I have. Uh, the one that uh, you and I have been talking about uh, recently, the John Minford translation, which is a very scholarly translation. It's actually two translations of the I Ching. One the the sort of the core what he calls the bronze age oracle and then the more uh confucian interpretation which he calls the book of wisdom which is uh something that is, has been as the I Ching has been expanded on by philosophers and um, and commentators over the the centuries so that gives a kind of a historical perspective the the Bronze Age Oracle version is very is uh, his attempt to get at the original I Ching from 1200 BC or where whatever time it was, and uh, what that may have meant, and then what it has become to mean. It has it grown into something philosophical, and then I'm going to use a a version. Um, one of Stephen Karcher is an author who has several versions of I Ching. He also worked with an, a scholar named Rudolf Ritzema. Uh, and uh, they, they um, this is a very, a Jungian approach, I guess you could say. It's a psychological approach going into, uh, they go into all of the meanings of the words and the ideas uh, in terms of their psychological and spiritual connotations. And that is um, a version that I have found to be really useful in a lot of um, personal consultations. Uh, the one that the particular book that I'm using for that is called How to Use the I Ching by Stephen Karcher. Uh, so we'll, I'll take a look at both of those. We'll get some different comparisons, different perspectives, and uh, see what it leads us to. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks so much for walking us through this. It's very exciting to get such a powerful hexagram together. Great. At CV Sciences, we love our full-spectrum hemp products. But for some people with sensitive jobs or sensitive systems, they want something with 0% THC. So we create a line of products called Happy Lane. Made with CBD from hemp grown in Kentucky, we have gummies, we have chews, we have liquids, we have soft gels, and we have the always beloved CBD roll-ons for applying to your skin. Everything is non-GMO, vegan, purity tested, and manufactured in the United States. So when life has you wound up, tense, agitated, antsy, uptight, jittery, or jumpy, try our Happy Lane line of CBD products. For 25% off, use the coupon code LEXFILES at pluscbd.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm very excited to start the last part, which is the explication of the hexagram. Number one going to number 11. And as we said earlier, it's uh, very exciting to have such a powerful reading. So, Fred, do you want to share your first thoughts uh, after consulting the various books that you have? Sure. Um, let's look back first at the question that I asked. Uh, and I, cause I wrote that down so we can get back to it. I said, we're recording this in 2020, a year of crises that have exposed weaknesses in our institutions and in our relations with the natural world. What sign may point us in a direction that will heal and strengthen our society? 
So, you know, most of the readings you do will probably be more personal or more limited than that, but that's kind of a big, broad question. And uh, the reading that we got is also so fundamental. I mean, um, it really, the, the first two signs in the I Ching are sky and earth. And those two actually, Qian and Kun, those two words taken together, like Qian Kun, uh, is used in Chinese as a, a synonym for the universe. So those take in everything. The first is all solid lines, uh, or uh, all yang, you could say. The second is all broken lines, or all yin. Yin and yang is something that comes along later in Chinese philosophy. It wasn't really uh, an idea at the time when the I Ching was originally composed, uh, the, the core of the I Ching divination system. But the idea of uh, sky and earth, which is kind of a, a shamanic uh, understanding of the universe, was there. And those are the first two uh, signs. And um, the sky represents light, power, strength. This is sort of comes from the the idea that the energy of the sun and the movement of the weather, the wind and the rain and so on is, and, and the stars is this, um, this energy source, which is uh, feeds into the earth. The earth is where everything returns to everything decays. And yet it's also where the magic happens. This energy goes into the earth and, comes out in the form of plants and trees and creatures and human beings. And um, there's this process of fertilization uh, is sort of uh, the, the fundamental operation of the living universe and the earth. So what we have, we, our reading was all solid lines, uh, all odd numbers, but we got changing lines in the top three places out of the six, the six lines, the top three were all changing lines. And um, so the top three lines, we also call it the, the inner or lower trigram and the outer or upper trigram. Um, and uh, the trigram also with all solid lines is also sky. Um, so when the, the upper lines all change, it really shows some, uh, something fundamental is changing. Sometimes we see the, uh, the inner trigram as representing the, the inner part of the situation we're looking at that is inside ourselves. And the outside world is represented by the upper trigram, the forces that are not within our, that, that are, that are outside of us or not within our control. And we see all of those changing. Every hexagram has, um, lines of verse to go with it, which are kind of like, uh, omens or something. Sometimes you can read all the six lines as a, a sort of a sequence in which, uh, often the first line is sort of the inception of a situ of a situation, and then it develops through two, three, four, five, and six is where it sort of breaks down, because the the fundamental underlying philosophical idea in the I Ching is that when things reach their extreme, they reverse. Things change when they go too far, and. Um, there are line. There are lines of verse associated with each. I'm going to read the the um, lines of verse associated with the fourth, fifth, and sixth line of the first hexagram. And uh, the first hexagram lines all describe the action of dragons. Dragons are uh, in Chinese um, Chinese symbolism. They really symbolize the uh, spirits of air and water. Um, so, uh, you know, a thunderstorm would be dragons fighting or uh, that, that sort of thing. You know, wind, everything that is in the sky is, uh, when the sky is alive, that's the dragons. The fourth um, 
line here describes dancing on the edge of an abyss. So that's a pretty strong image, right? Dancing on the edge of the abyss. And uh, I think it also says there's no, uh, no error. Um, so there's something, a chasm is opening up and yet the spirit is dancing. The fifth line is the dragon flying across the sky. And the sixth line is the, the overreaching dragon will have regrets. Sometimes some of the translators translate the arrogant dragon. Uh, the idea is that um, this is when these forces have gone too far and there's about to be a reversal. So I think that's what we're seeing represented in this, this uh, sign is the uh, hexagram. Uh, where the whole upper part is all changing at once. There's a, a, a really a sudden reversal. And maybe we can relate that to what we're seeing happen in society at this point. Um, we'll go into that a little bit more later, but let's go ahead and look at the, the, when we change those top three lines of the first hexagram, we get hexagram number 11, uh, which is most commonly known as called peace. Um, but it's one of the ones where the translations of the name of the hexagram vary quite a bit. Uh, a lot of these names of the hexagrams are not actually common words. There, some of them are, but some of them are you know, what they call hapax legomenon. They're words that only really, that's the only place they appear. So the only way of interpreting what they mean is by... Um, through the commentaries, through the uh, and and through comparing with other things, one of the great online resources on the I Ching is this uh, list of uh, translations of the hexagram names that uh, a scholar named Bradford Hatcher put together, and we can link to that. I think in the we could provide a link to that. Mm -hmm. uh, he says that peace is what uh, is the most commonly known name for number 11. He says in his note, he has a whole bunch of these different things. And some people translate it as uh, uh, prosperity, flowing, interplay, flourishing. Everything is very positive, right? He says peace doesn't really convey the core meaning of 11. The core meaning is closer to everything working together in a greater good. This is how things should be. Um, the peace doesn't really convey the dynamic energy and productive output of this exuberant interaction of forces. Synergy would be a better name if it wasn't so anachronistic. Um, and the way that, th that the, uh, all of most of the traditional, uh, interpretations of the hexagram C, this is, uh, number 11 is the upper trigram is earth and the lower trigram is sky. So it's earth above sky. Uh, normally we think of the sky being above and the earth below. Well, that is hexagram number 12, which is called stagnation or obstruction or um, uh, separating, decline, uh, has a very negative connotation. So um, the understanding is that the uh, well, the the judgment of number eleven hexagram, the the original verse that goes with it is, uh, the the small are going and the great are coming. Um, well, that's something that who knows what that means. You could interpret that in many ways, and but uh, the idea is that because the um, sky is within or below and the earth is above that they they're moving towards each other that they're they're interpenetrating and interacting and that's really what this uh, this hexagram is about if they're the other way around earth goes down sky goes up they're they're separating they're separating from each other so we see here like this coming together of the primal forces that makes me think of the the family stations that people assign 
to the mm-hmm. the trigrams. And so the the three yin lines would be the mother and the three yang lines would be the father. And yeah. so the image of this would be the mother on top of the father. Um, right, right. Which is procreation. So we're going directly from the creative mm-hmm. energy to something that feels like the mother and father uniting to create the next generation. Right. Uh, and it, it, and, and the, and the act of childbirth, which the I Ching talks about a lot and which is a very painful thing, but that's what it takes for the next age to be born. It usually right. doesn't happen without blood. Yeah. And, uh, you know, another way of seeing this, uh, this hexagram is that, uh, because the, this firm lines, uh, you know, represent strength and uh, firmness and, and light and so on. So that's what's within. And then the outside trigram, the upper one, is receptive. It's the open and receptive. And you could see that as like, this is the attitude that we should take. We need to be firm within, but receptive on the outside, soft on the outside, and strong on the inside. Uh, so it kind of s- suggests that as um, something to cultivate in in yourself. I also kind of think, because I, I asked this about in terms of like this changes that we're seeing happen in the world right now. And I, I think we can all feel that it, it's very chaotic. A lot of things are sort of breaking down. Um, you know, it's not just the, the pandemic uh, that has upended all of our lives, but also we're seeing... Uh, increasing crisis from from climate change and the systems of our economy uh, are not uh, no longer working to, uh, for the general good and our their political systems are uh, going through all kinds of uh, crisis. There's this great polarization, and so it seems so chaotic. It's very interesting to get a reading here that I think I would take as a very positive reading. But um, you know, one way of seeing this is we're at this point in history where we're um, we're sort of at the culmination of the industrial revolution, um, which has been a very um, it's very patriarchal and it's very, uh, it's very yang centered. You know, when you think about <laughs> all the, the symbols of, of the 20th century and, and it is, are, you know, the locomotive, the skyscraper, the rocket, they're all sort of phallic and powerful and thrusting. They're very yang, very, um, very much, um, even even in even the symbols of rebellion are like the fist, you know. Uh, so everything is about power and forcefulness, and it's extremely yang, man conquering nature. You know, it's been the theme for the last couple of hundred years in our society, and uh, so we're, maybe we're coming to a point where that is starting to change. Nature. The Earth is reasserting its needs. Uh, we see more and more uh, women taking positions of power. We are perhaps seeing some kind of reversal of this um, patriarchal expansion. And and um, you know, I think I asked you know, give us something a, a sign to. To focus, so this gives us a way of seeing things. Where even though I, I feel that for the rest of our lives we're going to be living in a very chaotic world, I, I don't see any way around it really. But if we can kind of see it that way as well, like this, this is the natural reversal of something that went a little too far in one direction. Um, then that is uh, maybe a way to see some of this in positive terms and maybe seeing it in those positive terms helps us in our own life to, um, to, to absorb some of this change and to try to um, take it in, in, in the best way that we can personally. 
it's always fascinating to me how the I Ching can be talking about something at a societal level that you see mirrored at the personal level. Mm -hmm. And what would you take from this for a person listening right now, for perhaps lessons we can draw in our own life about how to work with this shift that seems uh, so apparent right now? Yeah, well, you know, there was a thing that I said earlier uh, that you could see the hexagram number 11 uh, as representing strength within and softness on the outside. And I think that's really, that's what it's counseling, you know, um, that we, if we're facing all these crises, uh, we need to have our, our inner strength, our inner light, which is the, the yang thing, uh, that needs to be very firm on the inside and in the way that we approach the outside world, we need to be open. We need to be open to change. We need to be open to difference, different opinions, different ideas, new things. Uh, we need to be receptive and, you know, in the, the mode of earth, take things in and allow them to transform as they need to transform to become life. And when you talk about that strength, within and softness is out. The first thing I picture is a tree, which is so incredible at withstanding hurricanes and forces like that, why our solid steel buildings can get knocked over. And that's a, an image you often see in, in the I Ching. Right. And in, in a way, the, that is the, that, that's the image of this, this whole thing. Number, uh, number one and the first and second hexagrams are you know, the sky and the earth. And the tree is really, the, that's the ancient shamanic symbol of the unifying of those two forces. The, the tree has branches reaching into the sky and roots reaching into the earth, and it draws from both to create its living form, which is something that it, it's, it's totally, it's integrating the two, which is what hexagram 11 is about, that is those forces intermingling, coming into relation uh, rather than moving apart. The tree symbolizes that which really brings those cosmic forces together uh, in a productive way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the cool parts is that a tree is a mirror. Its roots generally tend to look exactly like what's above the ground. Right. And yeah, which is a really beautiful image. And yeah. something I wanted to expand upon that I found that it sounds very similar to what you've been saying. Uh, there's a book called Gene Keys, which hmm. I'm sure um, it's by a guy named Richard Rudd. And it's really a fascinating work because he lines up the 64 uh, codons of the human genetic code to the 64 hexagrams. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, it's it's really a fascinating piece for anyone who's interested in this. I know people disagree with some of his interpretations, but that's the fun of the I Ching. Everybody disagrees with everybody over something. Um, but he, for each of the hexagrams, he sees that they would have a a a shadow side to them when it's not mm -hmm. really being manifested, and then yeah. a more a gift side when you kind of start activating that piece of yourself and then a, a party calls a city, which, you know, the, the grandness, if you really become a super being in this one, it becomes that. So mm -hmm. talking about the gift of the 11th, uh, he calls it idealism or magic realism. And it reminded me a lot of what you were saying that the power of people to be, to use their imagery and their creative power uh, coming from the right side of their brain, that's what's going to help heal the world, using our creative energy to try yeah. to think really well and f and connect that to our yin side, our feminine side. And he talks about how the historic repression of the feminine and women is a manifestation of this balance of our brains being uh, two to one side, too much into this power side and not enough into the um, the creative flexibility and that this is part of, this imagery can really be linked to our ancestral past to a time not necessarily when things are better i don't want to say that when we were tribal everything was better than it is today um 
but that there is, I think, an encouragement in this reading for us to apply the creative energy we have to the problems that are right in front of us. You know, I'm my my job is not to solve politics uh, or to solve the pandemic or to solve any of these things. But my job is to be a, as good a father as I can to my child, to be as good a husband uh, to my mm-hmm. wife and to work at my projects as creatively as I can. And I've been getting a lot of readings like that lately. And it's interesting. That this mm. one seems to align to that, that this is a time for us to be creative because with the world as chaotic uh, as we see it, it's also the time when great changes can happen and they could happen even quicker than we expect. That's right. Uh, You know, crises kind of open a door when things are just going along, it's very difficult for change to happen, but change, positive or negative change becomes possible when something when a crack opens up, you know, and I think we're at a place like, like that in the society. You know, I the thing I mentioned about the strength within and receptiveness on the outside, a lot of things in uh, I Ching, you know, really you can understand them by, by looking at their, their opposite. And I think what we see a lot of people doing now in society is they feel, they feel vulnerable on the inside. They feel threatened. They feel weak. And to respond to that, they create this hard outer shell. They're armored, they're armed, they're, they're angry, they're, they're pushed, they're fighting. And I think that what this is, what this, this reading is counseling for us is something quite the opposite. Make the, make your inner values, your inner, um, your inner light keep that firm and strong. That's your core and trust that. And then on the outside, be open, be receptive, be changeable. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a much more productive way to be um, in a time of crisis. One thing I wanted to add that seems kind of hopeful that you never know how much to put into this, but th- Hexagrams are often associated with time of year. And according to Wilhelm, uh, the classic, um, one of the yeah. classic translations of the century, yep. that this hexagram, uh, number 11, the completed hexagram uh, of this reading, belongs to the first month of February and March, when the mm. forces of nature prepare for the new spring, when the trees bud. And that, you know, maybe this is the, the winter of our discontent. Uh, I, mm. you just, I think we, there's kind of a gut feeling it's still going to be a tough winter, but that the I spring, think so. <laughs> yeah, it does. It feels that way. Who knows what the future will bring? Um, but that the spring really could be a, a, a time of change. Um, and that maybe it isn't just referring to the, the spring of February and March, but the spring of a, of a new time for us. People are getting creative right now about yeah. how to solve these problems and no one knows what's quite going to look like but it it makes me think of the tree of good and evil which is a, an archetypal tree that you can picture as having all of the ideas hanging onto it there for the picking if you can visualize it think about it work with it and it reminds me of one of the other great books in human thought that is also very mysterious, the Hermetica. Mm -hmm. The thing that I learned from the Hermetica that helped me the most was near the end, they talk about building a temple in your head where you have a certain number of statues. um, And each of those statues is an archetypal idea. And that just like the memory houses you hear about it when people play memory oh, games, yeah. you memorize the mm-hmm. house of cards, you build a memory house. Well, they're talking about this, but at the next level, you build a wisdom house for yourself. And it's going to be different for everybody. Uh, I read one book on magic that was like 500 pages long. And the last line was the key to magic is you create your own archetypes. Mm-hmm. And so to build a temple in your head of the most important ideas to you, many of them that you, you hang there, you can maybe even walk through it if you're a visual person person and it it helped me so much to think about thinking and to think about creativity and how to affect the world and it seems like this reading is reminding me of that again that it it takes work to build that kind of temple in our head but it helps to build our own 
inner strength when we do so. And then when you're presented with the problems of the world, it's easier to have uh, some answers right there. And the the last part I'll say about that is that is also somewhat how the I Ching seems to work. When I first started working with it, with it years ago, I would consult it a lot and I would be confused by it and I was actually doing it wrong. I was reading oh, yeah. the, the hexagram lines from the top down is how right. I was doing it. So it was all wrong. It was probably backwards completely, but I assumed the book was, you know, forgiving and still giving me the right things knowing I was doing it wrong. But eventually the I Ching starts to become integrated into your thoughts and you start to get these ideas of balance and not letting things go too far. And yeah. you don't have to consult the book. In fact, it's wrong to consult the book all the time when you know the answer. Don't act, you know, don't ask uh, simple questions that you already know the answer to. Ask when you're confused. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of my thoughts about how the archetypes of these things help to answer, I think, the question that we put to it this time. Yeah. And, you know, it's great that you mentioned that at first you were confused, you were building the hexagrams from the top down. And they're supposed to be built from the bottom up. You start at the bottom line and build them up. Um, and, I, you know, I think that there's something really profound just in, in that, you know, our language, we, all of our reading, we read from the top down. Um, and that kind of programs us into a certain way of thinking. We think from the top down. Our society works from the top down. When we think about revolution and change, we think about, you know, deposing the tyrant, which historically hasn't worked very well when we've done that, because usually just some other tyrant takes the place, you know, someone worse in many cases. Uh, and I think that we're, we're really looking at uh, building a new, a new way of being on earth, which is, I think, what humans are called to at this point in history, we need to think about building from the bottom up. You know, a, a, a tree grows from the ground up. Uh, you, you mentioned the image of a temple, building a temple in your head. A temple is built from the ground up. You know, a build, any building, you start with the foundation, you start with the earth. And, you, and if you're building a, an organization or something, you start people person to person uh, and, and, and build something from the ground up. And I think that, uh, that it's a very, one of the great things about the I Ching is that it, it little bit reprograms your mind from thinking top down to thinking bottom up, you know, that's a great thought. And it actually reminds me since you're in New York, uh, it reminds me of something that Frederick Olmsted said, um, he's the guy who designed Prospect Park and Central oh, Park. Yeah, um, and he, yeah, and he was he was also a great journalist and a great thinker. And he one of his theories that has been picked up by social theorists was that one of the most important things in societies is all of the small clubs that humans form more than our giant institutions. It is the the small dance clubs. It is the marionette troupe that meets in mm. Central Park. It, it is yeah. all of these. It's it's our small churches. It's these things that hold us together and shared interests, which now we would call civil society uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. But the idea that these small interconnected um, n nodules uh, that connect all to each other was what makes society so tough and resourceful and strong. And that that idea has become more and more important. And again, it's a, a bottom up kind of idea. Right. And it seems to speak again to the answer that we're talking about here. Probably most of us listening to this aren't called to gigantic acts that will get our names in the history book for a couple of generations. The mm -hmm. thing that we're going to do is going to be the small things in our community, the little clubs we start, the food right. banks we work for and, and things like that. And it makes, it's nice because it makes the problem feel more solvable. I don't have to do these giant things. I do have to do these things that are right in front of me and a little bit more than makes me comfortable. 10, 20% more. And that might be all I'm called to do, but to, to work at that at least. Right. And, you know, and maybe, uh, that's something that the, the pandemic gives us also because, uh, you know, this sort of mass massing together is like not really safe, but your, your small 
groups, your one-on-one relationships are very, very important to cultivate in a time like this, you know? Uh, and, uh, so we're sort of being naturally redirected in that way. I just want to talk a little bit more about the, the changing lines from the first hexagram. Yeah. Because I think they're so intriguing with the dragons because they're such an important part of the cosmology right. of what's talking here and dancing along the abyss seems to be such a beautiful way to state what we're doing. Yes. It feels like things are falling apart. Yes. It feels like yeah. tough times and, uh, and autocratic and all over the world and, and far right movements gaining power exactly like they did a century ago. But it's also just part of life. All of this, unfortunately, is so natural. The more you study history, the more the time right now just seems exactly, it's not what I want, but it seems exactly to make sense with what's happening. And all yeah. we can do is dance along the edge of the abyss and enjoy it as, right. as much as we can. And and the, the, tr- the idea of dancing uh, means also it's not like... Um, you know, considered deliberate action. It's, it's like really focusing on, uh, grace on, uh, rhythm on, um, uh, on lightness. And, um, so, uh, that's, um, maybe that's, maybe that's the key to being, to safely navigating the edge of the abyss is to be a dancer. That might be the perfect spot to end. Okay, great. And hopefully this will also turn some of the people listening onto your art as well. Uh, Fred is a okay. great artist in all kinds of different directions, from poetry to visual arts. And he has a great newsletter that I always enjoy getting. It's a nice boost to my day to see the things he's created. So we'll have all the links to his work in the episode notes. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to keep watching your art uh, over these next years. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, find us at pluscbdoil.com or on YouTube or on all the podcast platforms. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com or follow the podcast on Twitter at the Lex Files Show. If you enjoyed this program, please rate us on iTunes or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. Our chief advisor is Amabel De La Cruz. The music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. And our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. Remember the coupon code, Lex Files. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.